Hey and hello, my name is Geno Samuel and welcome back to the next installment of Discography's Yes, where I take a very in-depth look and review at every studio album by the prog rock group Yes, in chronological order. If you don't know what I'm talking about, or if you've missed anything, check out the playlist in the description below. Catch up. So the new brand spanking lineup featuring John Davidson on lead vocals eventually got working on some new materials in 2012 and 2013, during and after their world tour. Steve Howe, the guitarist, didn't want to rush into things too fast after Fly From Here or else they would botch the album, or so he thought. Davidson would go visit everyone at their home all over the world, in the US and the UK, pretty much, and write songs together, a way to bring himself closer to the band and as a consequence receiving a co-writing credit on all but one of the new tracks on this upcoming album. When it came to recording the album, they first considered their Fly From Here producer and former Yes lead vocalist Trevor Horn to produce the album, but conversations fell through. Then they went to Roy Thomas Baker, who had worked with some huge acts including Queen, Foreigner and Journey. Yes and Baker had previously tried to record an album in Paris back in 1979, but things fell apart when the band fell apart and had a reshuffle of lineup. He was quite enthusiastic to work with the band again, so he was hired. Billy Sherwood, the occasional Yes collaborator and producer and engineer, arrived a bit later to mix the backing vocals on this album. So what resulted from these recording sessions was a selection of 8 tracks, ranging from 4 to 9 minutes, so without any major prog epics this time, dominating the album. Howe said that these tracks all had different spices and flavors, and that was the whole point, to show off these different sides of the band. Apparently, Howe and keyboardist Jeff Downs had written an expansive prog epic, but didn't have time to refine it and stick it on the album. Maybe it's gonna show up later. Anyway, let's begin with the opening track, Believe Again. Starts with a nice little fade in guitar line that we'll hear throughout. And after a single cycle, we get the expected snare flam to bring in the rest of the band. And here he comes. Ah, I see. Alan White is using the cardboard box drum kit from Tornado. Alan White has not been in the best health in recent years and his performance reflects that, I feel. Um, a certain weakness and tiredness, but it's kind of unavoidable as far as I'm aware. Um, I think it might make a significant difference, however, if they had placed the microphones in the same room as the, the, the drums. Um, there's a certain distance in the drum quality, a lack of punch, and a consistent reverb. Anyway, musically, the chords take on an optimistic and you and I feel, following the same chord progression of 1, 4, 5, 4 of and you and I, and also your move. Chris Squire does a steady root note. <laughs> then the moment we've all been waiting for, for John D's first notes. So I climbed to the top of a mountain mind! Well, the lyrics sound like we're in the middle of whatever perpetual spiritual journey epiphany story he's telling, so that just kind of threw me off, you know, just beginning with the so I climbed. Uh, lyrically, John D is trying for a John A feel of painting a picture with the vocabulary, though it does tend to occasionally create some dodgy melody rhythms and, as a result, fails to forge a memorable melody. There's like a big rush to squeeze in more memorable lyrics in this small space of music. There's lots of harmonizing with Chris Squire, who is in the other room way over there. Lots more distance. I must say, the pre-chorus features a pretty jazzy feel, and combo of melody and chords remind me of something Glass Hammer would do. The chorus is pretty simple, simple chords, just plain major or minor, in keeping with the predicted structure of the song's tonality. The song goes through another verse and chorus cycle, which doesn't deviate much from what preceded. Then we go into the middle instrumental section. There's an introduction of some hand percussion, and the mood goes dark. Bass follows the same rhythm pattern of the verses, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, but enters a descending motif. Now this is starting to sound like something I'd expect from the band. Then it gets a little sucky when Howe comes in with ascending scales, which sound like finger warm-ups, honestly. There's some back and forth with guitar and keys, which is nice. 
but it still overall r remains kind of lazy slash tired sounding. Wish this was more developed and expanded and more complex. Then we get another verse and chorus, which isn't much different, except for the addition of percussion in the back. There's a little guitar solo towards the end based around the opening melody, with Downs playing held chords on the organ. After one more final chorus, there's a big old closing line and a call back to the beginning with a fade in guitar. Continuing the full cycle of structuring songs that end the way it starts, all the way back to their first album. There's some interesting ideas here, but overall it feels tired and oversimplified and uninspired. Though I imagine my opinion of the tracks would be improved if it was mixed differently. There's just so much reverb on a lot of the stems and it just creates distance when possibly the goal was to create depth and a sense of a larger scale. You know... Marillion's 1998 album Radiation is widely regarded as their worst, and the band admits so themselves. So for the 15th anniversary of that album, they remixed it, and I believe even re-recorded some parts, like the drums. And the songs themselves remained unchanged in essence, but just the sound of how they were presented was improved so much. So much so that the album becomes a much more pleasurable listening experience. Just goes to show that the sound quality and the treatment of the music in post-production is so crucial to the overall appeal of the songs. Next up is The Game. Features another opening on guitar. This time it's on Howe's lap steel guitar, I believe. It's a pretty cool melody with a soft pad of chords holding down the fort. This guitar line gives way to a new chord progression and a pulsing electric piano. Dun, 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 dun. Some light percussive thumping in the back, I think played by a muted bass, all building up to something epic. Then Davison comes in with a toned down chorus line with pretty minimal accompaniment. We all know the rules, the game us fools, still we play the same as if our days remain. It's a much more secure melody and lyric combo than the previous track. It's catchy, if you will. The chorus also features an iconic ah, 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 chant, making it feel like a pop song, honestly. <laughs> then the drums usher in the verse. The bass stays quite high up and subdued, playing lengthy notes which results in a lackluster bottom end. Even the kick drum isn't too prominent, and is clustered around only the first beat of each bar. And that's not a negative. In, in this case, the arrangement works wonders. It creates an emptiness that makes you hunger for the satiation that will surely follow in the chorus. The bridge section gets tribal with lots of tom action, building up intensity. Then it's the chorus, now complete with proper bass and drums. It's cool. It's catchy. The kick drum stays back still, focusing on the first beat of the measure mostly. I pondered whether I'd like it to be more consistent like a proper backbeat or leave it as is, because honestly the game is quite an accessible track, and whatever unusual properties they decided to introduce into the music, it pays off really well. It's at the chorus that we get another go at that millennial chant, now with Chris doing do 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 a more intense verse, melodically higher, I mean, follows a pretty nice guitar solo which focuses on that opening melody. Then another verse and another chorus. Very standard stuff. The bass line is very simple, just pulsing. Like an indie rock song, honestly. <laughs> Lots of chanting, ha 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 ha, as if in the live show this is the part where the audience sings back to the band. How starts making noodles in the last minute all the way through into the final fade out, and it's not that delicious, honestly. But this is this turned out to be one of my favorite tracks on the album. It's more simple in structure, but that's not an issue. Whether they want to do prog prog or something prog adjacent is up to them. With some slight tweaks, this is pretty much just a commercial pop song, honestly, like a like a pop rock song, but the good kind. Next up is Step Beyond. Begins with a keyboard riff for a change this time. Uh, good old monophonic woo 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 on a monomodular. You can almost imagine the beat that will follow. A fun up tempo number, maybe. Uh, and it's not at all what happens. The band leisurely hops in with how proving a new melody that would become the verse. Um, how do I put it? 
The music is kind of infantile and annoying, honestly. Sticking to a basic 1-4-1-5 chord progression in, in major tonality. How sings in unison with the new John, and Squire then joins in to provide a harmonized call and answer pattern. After the initial verse, though, it just gets a little more interesting, with the bitey how guitar bit introducing a minor tonality this time, and the catchy line, Beck, steal, rob, run, hide. Very scary words to match with the scary minor music. Next up is a brief run of the 1415 progression, but this time it's in minor. To reflect on how the lyrics are more about not nice things now. Then we swiftly go back to the major one again. There is a bridge section that harkens back to the 1960s with that organ prominently playing block chords and a four on the snare drum pattern. It gets more and more interesting as it goes on, it's harmonically different and features more adventurous chords and very high notes from Davison. It concludes with a resounding BEYOND! BEYOND! as nice tinkly keys make it sound a bit more angelic. Next comes another very stupidly happy verse, and then the minor chorus of Beg Steel, yada yada yada. Then followed by the other chorus, which I guess is just the same as the verse, except with everyone repeating one step beyond, one step beyond, four times. How makes it more complex sounding with a solo that's, as ever, grossly inappropriate. Then there's one more final tinkly underneath a beyond that repeats and ascends three times. Squire in the backing vocals is hanging on for dear life singing that line. <laughs> Sounds like the note is bigger than what he can comfortably manage at his current age and shape, that is. And then it's over. Step Beyond sounds, at least to me, unbelievably promising and inspiring with its opening lead line, this, like it's opening three seconds and then just plummets as soon as everyone joins in. But let's ascend beyond that to to ascend. Track four. At this point, the tracks have been consistently been getting shorter and shorter, starting with the opening eight minute number, and now we get a four minutes and change piece. It opens with a somber rhythm in 6-8 time, played on house Mexican ukulele. Chris comes in high on his bass, and this mood and chord progression reminds me a lot of Show Me, this a new at the time acoustic track that the band recorded for their 35th anniversary compilation release. John comes in low, bringing you thoughtful lyrics about the passing of time. No mention of river, thank god. The piano and synth strings fill up the sonic space as the melody gets higher leading up to the chorus, which is the first time that the drums show up. The chorus is equally well crafted. Very nice melody and feels naturally married to the lyrics. Taking the time on a wing and a prayer, a wounded bird in the hand. Rich multilayered harmonies sticking all the way through. I love the last line especially as John sings, As a free bird flies from the hand. Because the piano plays a repeated arpeggiated chord, think carpet crawlers like signifying the flying away. To ascend, to ascend. And so far, the song is a mix of mood between wondrous stories and show me. Musically speaking, this is feeling the most complete, the most interesting work so far. It's more emotive and engaging because of how well-crafted it is. The addition of the minor chord in the chorus is mm -hmm, Chief's Kiss. Two choruses more follow, and at the end, the free bird flies from the hand one more time as the piano lifts up and up and up and flies away as well. A phase out effect closes the song. Perfect. This might be close to being my favorite on the album. Um, I don't know. When this album gets good, it's, it's pretty nice, but then apart from the highlights, it's awfully duddy. Like for example, the next track, <laughs> In a World of Our Own. It starts with a very simple drum beat, which is what you've learned to accept from this album. Then the band comes in with a primitive groove, vaguely bluesy. A midi-like piano sound plays a vamp. 
they're sticking with this single plain minor chord for most of the verse, honestly. Acoustic guitar simply strumming the chords continues throughout the whole song. What's wrong with a new revolution? It sounds like more pseudo hippie mantra. Um, everyone's sounding sleepy for the verses, at least. The pre chorus offers up a change, new chords, and the setup to build up to the chorus. Why must you always lie to me? In concept, the chorus is kind of intriguing. Squire comes in with a backline, Living in the world of our own. Answered by John, Living in a world of our own. Living in a... And that's definitely the highlight of the song. Then they go back into their attempt of blues. There's lots of organ work from Downs to give it that vintage feel. After the second chorus, we get our prog segment, It Dumb. Guitar plays a weird disjointed sequence of major chords together with bass and organ. And then we get another cycle of that with guitar solo on top of it. Another chorus, living in a world of a... And then finally a little callback to that instrumental break just with the minor version of those chords. Dun, 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 dun. I don't have much to say apart from that because it's rather boring. Also, the song is f finished at this point. I, I, I got to the end. I remember the band first released the lyric video for this song on YouTube to promote the new album. Like this would be their top single. And it's quite confuddling since this is pretty much near the bottom of what this album has to offer. Moving on to the next peak of the Heaven and Earth roller coaster is Light of the Ages. It honestly is literally so far, you can sum up the tracks as bad, good, bad, good, bad, good. This one is on the longer side and starts off promising with some vibey synths. Do, 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 do. An instrumental proggy intro follows with a more active bass line going for a jaunty walk. A solo on slide guitar fills out the top squeaky end. Keyboards play a triad based motif. There's some sparse drumming and is centered on the hi-hat mostly. There's a brief moment in which the chords change up to play the same chords as to ascend. Uh oh. Quick, change again before we start repeating ourselves. After about a minute 40 of this build up intro, we get to the song proper, now changing to a 6-8 time again, and simple strummed chords on acoustic guitar accompanying vocals. And the opening line is truly a moment where John Davidson really gets the Anderson method of using phonics and sounds of the words as a type of instrument down perfectly. A beacon is shining across the cosmos is guiding, igniting a pathway for us. Reminds me of the opening lines in Awaken. You know, the, the single repeating note high, high vibration go up. Back to this, the chords are interesting, and so is the arrangement. It's only two minutes in, but sounds so much more, um, fascinating than anything that has gone before. We get into a short instrumental groove, which changes tonality to minor, and a 6-4 feel, mostly aided by the beat switch up. An arpeggiated piano creates a mysterious and dark mood. Also, Squire on bass plays notes that you wouldn't really expect to be here. It's like a melodic bass line, but ever so subtle, and it's unintrusive. The melody and lyrics are solid so far. Some of Davidson's best work, to be honest. There's some cool switching between 6-8 and 6-4, almost like it's prog. As Davidson belts out, I will follow you. I like how you don't expect a lot of what is happening. This is what should have been happening more of on this album. At least, good and pleasant unexpected things. Then we go back into the verse section, now with a more steady drum beat. Chris is very distantly providing backing vocals and harmonies, while also playing a killer bass line that slides around a lot between low and high. Then right after, they move into the minor section again, which plays out much the same as before. Sounds very troubling. Then after this, Downs introduces a new motif, now in 4-4 on piano, another minor sequence which sounds interesting but doesn't go on for very long. Some slidey guitar solo accompanies the chords with a melody. It's a, it's a shame it doesn't go on for longer, nor does it appear again. If the track as a whole was longer, it could have been revisited and developed further. 
there's one more final beacon is shining bit until we go into the repeating outro segment with Slidey whining in the back from Hal and lots of the light of the ages as the song fades out. This is the closest the band has gotten to a more classical sounding, polished, intricate yes of old. It's really, for the most part, it's really nice and memorable. That was the rise. Now here comes the fall. It was all we knew. From the start, it has a very 60s-esque feel. Simple, happy acoustic guitar chords strumming away and an offbeat bass basing away. Steve Howe comes in with a simplistic melody on guitar, playing in unison with the keys. It's quite cheerful. This riff would later turn into the chorus melody. It features one bar that is cut in half in length to better match the melodic structure. The verse that comes in is quite unexpected. It features a more complex chord structure, jazzy even, and a whirly keeping the chords in check in the back. Two or three part harmony remains consistent throughout. Then into the chorus. Sweet were the fruits, long were the summer days, summer days. It was all we knew. I get the 60s feel because I think that was the point. The lyrics are nostalgic, looking back on brighter, younger dates. Then finally we hear something sounding a bit more yesy after that bit. An instrumental with everyone in unison, just simple runs up. If they were younger, they would have made it more interesting than that. This is a kind of cycling upwards pattern that is heard a few times on this album. It's the new craze that influenced the band, I, I presume. Following that, there's a lot of how soloing going on in the second verse. Um, I mean, of course, because this is definitely Steve Howe's composition. The second chorus doesn't change much from the first, and then a key change. Didn't see that coming. New key and new lyrics. Everything so easy, didn't have to ask, have to ask why we're here. Then back to the sweets lyric, but the chorus is in the lower key, yet another modulation. A repeated all we knew finishes the song. I'm itching for a revisit of that instrumental line in the middle, da -da 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 -da, which doesn't happen. It's not that spectacular, but just as a personal compositional preference, if it's so different from the rest of the song, um, that section could have could have made another appearance at the end, but it don't. Mm, and it's eh. Not too special, but far from terrible though. And so we reach the closing number, Subway Walls. The longest track, clocking in at 9 minutes and 2 cents. Jeff Down starts it off with held chords on synth strings starts in a major tonality, and then unexpectedly switches to minor. Actually, this sounded a bit familiar. I had to look this up, because I don't think many people noticed, but Downs actually plagiarized from himself here. The motif in the intro is in fact the chord progression of the chorus of the track Desire by Asia, off their 1994 album Area. At this point, Downs was the only original member remaining, so Steve Howe was long gone. Not only is the chord progression the same, but there is also a melodic sequence that is the same in both tracks. I mean, is it really stealing if you're stealing from yourself? Uh, this isn't exactly unheard of, especially within Yes. Heck, this goes back to at least 1971, when Steve Howe re reworked an instrumental he had originally worked on with his previous band, and it ended up on Starship Trooper. So it's weird that it has happened so frequently, especially with this single band by a variety of people. This isn't like an unreleased demo, either. This is commercially available stuff here. Kinda makes you think that they're taking from the past, cause sure as hell they can't come up with anything this good now. Anyway, the subdued dramatic strings are further accompanied by counter string melodies, vibes, and synth timpani. Very Asia-esque, of course, until suddenly it cuts off with slow melancholic strings modulating down and leading into the true groove of the song, with electric piano establishing a new normal for the song. A lovely bass line rises up, very chorusy. The melody is then played in unison with the guitar. It's a promising start, let me tell ya. Then Squire truly gets a go at shining bright like a diamond. At first, Alan White plays in unison with Chris on the snare drum. 
an intense bass line that goes Hal occasionally chimes in with dissonant chords as John starts singing. It's a difficult melody and arrangement, at first leaving you lost. At the end of a single verse cycle, they change the time signature from 4-4 to an odd one. Can't figure it out, but maybe it's 15-8. Very, very, very briefly. It really catches you off guard. So it's pretty exciting, musically at least. After one more verse sequence, we get to a pretty lovely chorus, which I think reflects on who we are as people, and whether graffiti on subway walls showcases the best of what we got. I think, I don't know. The bass continues to play its own melody to counter the vocals. As lovely as it is, the vocal melody is less sticky than the bass one, and not as memorable. After another cycle of verse and chorus, we get into the instrumental break with bass leading the way, bringing back the odd time signature groove we heard briefly before. Now it's a definite 15-8 time groove. Makes you want to jam together with the boys. First bass with some clap sounds, then drums, then guitar, and then organ. All building up to the band going fuller and fuller. Then Downs gets his chance to shine like a nearly extinguished filament too for his organ solo. It, yeah, it, it, it kind of sucks, not gonna lie. A Steve Howe solo takes over after Downs thinks he's finished. It's it's all right, it get, but it gets worse as it progresses. The most I remember is that bit where he goes. All the while, drums and bass keep going dun 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 together. And neither solo matches the mood set up by the backers that much. After a healthy dose of solos, the band go back into the chorus. And that, that was okay. That one was okay. Then the drums cut out. And gets you curious about what's gonna come next. And it is a largely 7-8 section inspired by the opening orchestra section. Piano, synth strings, and now the band too join in. There's some periodic vocal lines which are quite dodgy. They don't match with the rhythm, or at least don't have a solidly grounded pacing of their own. They're suffering from whatever late stage Marillion have, and take all these words they wrote down, but can't turn them into a, a smooth sounding lyric for, for the song. As this final section progresses, there's less and less of the vocal lines, and instrumentation gets louder, drums quicken the pace, and eventually achieve a double time feel. More counter melodies come in, such as Steve's pattern going down like Kinda sounds like Rock Vivaldi at this point. A couple of more harmonized Transcend! Follow, and then the song blows up at the end. Crashes into one final chord, and that's the end of the song. My word is much the same as everyone else's in saying that Subway Walls is probably the best track on the album, the closest to what we've come to understand as sounds like yes. The structure of the whole album is kind of intriguing in that if you took all the eight tracks and labeled them as either amongst the top four best songs or the top four bad songs, you will see that the weakest half of the album is the odd number tracks, and the top four are the even number ones. Seems like they knew this in a way and didn't want to put two songs of familiar strength back to back. Heaven and Earth was released in July 2014, with album art, of course, by Roger Dean. I'm pretty sure this is the same floating island that crashed into the planet that, that is depicted on the Yes Songs artwork, I believe. Just imagined 40 years later, covered with multiple layers of ice. It's pretty cool. Anyway, the album charted in the UK and peaked at number 20, the highest since Talk in 1994. It reached some decent top 100 positions in many territories around the world. But the reviews were very mixed, and I feel the same. The band feels very tired. I mean, the core three members are not as young as they used to be. Alan White especially sounds like he has so little energy and power to drum anymore. And it doesn't help with the fact that the mix is odd. There's a noticeable reverb on drums especially, and also the vocals, that make the song sound washed out. Davidson is alright, and it's debatable whether he's quote-unquote better than Benoit David, who came before him. John Dee definitely lacks a certain grit, just a bit too pleasant when he could be more powerful, something John Anderson was great at, switching to it whenever necessary. The album as a whole, there's a couple of 
strong tracks, a bunch of fairly good tracks, and a couple of bumpy ride level tracks. The engineering also could have been a lot better. Heaven and Earth by Yes gets a 6 out of 10 from me. Just, just slightly above the middle. During this time period, the band was doing lots of album tours, in that they would choose a couple of albums from their repertoire and play them in their entirety. Davison was his usual fine self, Downs had trouble keeping up, How couldn't keep up, Fingers getting too slow, Squire was alright, but, but getting a big, big though. And White was very weak, man, <laughs> just sad seeing them like that. They really want to hang on to the legacy by being the last prog rock band standing, but they can't play the way they did anymore. It just doesn't sound all that good. Anyway, in May 2015, Chris Squire revealed that he was diagnosed with acute erythroid leukemia. I believe that's how it's pronounced. I might be wrong. This meant that for Yes's planned summer tour together with Toto, Billy Sherwood would take over as the temporary bassist for the band. But after failing to recover from an operation, Chris Squire died on June 27th. Um, it was big news for the music world, and lots of musicians and fans alike came out to pay their respects, citing him as a huge influence on rock music in general. I mean, I was not okay too, for about a couple of days. I saw the announcement first on Jeff Downs' Facebook page. I started working on a cover of Hold Out Your Hand slash You By My Side off the Squire solo album Fish Out of Water, but gave up. I might, I might still make it one day. According to the band, Squire encouraged the band to keep going, just in case anything happened. So Sherwood became the new bassist for Yes. During the first tour with Squire ever, they did this little tribute where they would bring out Chris's Rickenbacker bass onto the stage and shine a spotlight on it and play it onwards, which was written by Chris Squire in the background. It was lovely. Sherwood was not the greatest at first, but I think he got better as the shows and tours went along. They also started doing Cruise to the Edge, which is which is a cruise escapade with prog rock theme. Yes are the hosts, and every year it features other prog acts, so it seems like a fun place to be if you have the money and the time for it. More album tours followed. By the time they started doing the best half of Tales from Topographic Oceans live, White was out of commission because of back surgery, I believe, which then meant that drums would be played by Jay Shellen, a buddy of Sherwood's, and they were in the band's circuit together. And he'd also played with Asia featuring John Payne, so he was quite adept with the prog rock world. He was great, and kind of unfortunately, it, it improved the overall sound of the band so much. If you have a strong backbone, Sorry, Alan. It, it makes a world of difference. It goes to show that as the band gets slowly assimilated by younger players, I think it might regain vitality. Alan would occasionally join in as an additional special guest drummer for some encores later on. Also in that year, John Anderson, Rick Wakeman, and Trevor Rabin finally got together after discussing the prospect of this new band for many years. They toured together with Lou Molino III on drums and Lee Pomeroy on bass. And damn, they were good. Maybe I was wrong about my old people can't play theory. I don't know. Just looking at those two lineups now, I feel like ARW featured m more more positive people than the other e really yes, the the other yes, without any original members at this point. So this was almost like another situation of two yeses, like back in the late 1980s, which eventually got together and made the Union album and tour. But nothing like that transpired this time. But in 2017, the Union lineup of Yes was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Bill Bruford also showed up, but Tony Kaye did not. And Chris Squire was posthumously awarded the honor as well. After the speeches, everyone present except Bruford played Roundabout, with Geddy Lee from Rush on bass. And then they played Owner of a Lonely Heart with Steve Howe on Rickenbacker bass, which and, and it looked like he had a lot of fun. Howe's son Dylan, however, noted that both the Yes Band and the ARW Band were seated at tables next to each other, but ignored each other. So maybe don't expect that reunion coming up anytime soon. Anyway, ARW soon disbanded after releasing only one original song, titled Fragile. In 2017, Yes had another tragedy when their tour was cut short suddenly after the unexpected death of Steve Howe's son Virgil of a heart attack, it seems. After a little time of resting and grieving, 
the band were back on the road again, touring with more albums and occasional guest appearances from the likes of Tony Kay, Trevor Horn, and even Patrick Mraz. In 2018, the band celebrated their 50-year anniversary, and with no original members in the lineup, it only made sense to bring in Kay, you know? <laughs> They had a quiet and small, sort of unofficial but official release in 2019, which will be the subject of the next episode, so check it out. In the meantime, I want to thank you so much for watching, and if you like what you see, please click the like button and subscribe for more videos like this and other original music. If you like what I do and want to support, please check out my Patreon. Link is in the description below, along with any other relevant links. Thanks again. and I'll see you around. I must say the pre-chorus features a pretty jazzy feel and a combo... <laughs> a song's so catchy. <clears throat>